Are you ready to get into Yah's Word today? Amen. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to begin in just a moment with verse 15. And I've called this message, Counting the Omer, Preparing for the Outpouring. Everybody say, I'm preparing preparing. for the outpouring. So we're going to talk about counting the Omer. All right, Leviticus chapter 23, starting with verse 15. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, in other words, from the morrow after the weekly Sabbath and Passover week, or the first day of the week, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Now, we did that uh, this past gathering. Uh, we waited until the sun went down on Shabbat, and that was first fruits, and we, we brought in our first fruits offering. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. Now, how many days is seven completed Sabbaths? Forty-nine. So some of you were awake in math class. That's beautiful. I love that. You shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. You count how many days? Fifty days in all. Then you shall bring a new grain offering. Okay? And this is of the wheat harvest. Okay? You bring a new grain offering to Yah. Bring from your dwellings for a wave offering two loaves of bread of two-tenths of an ephah, of fine flour, they are, notice it says, baked with leaven. So now you can put leaven in it, praise Yah. Amen. First fruits to Yah. And so again, we're, we're talking about counting the Omer, and we're talking about the days between uh, first fruits and Shavuot. So starting with Yom HaBikarim, uh, that's the day of first fruits. You begin counting seven complete Sabbaths and a day, and welcome to the first of the seven Sabbaths. We have uh, six more and a day. Amen? So the total is 50 days. By the way, Pentecost means 50 days. All right? This counting leads us to the Feast of Shavuot, which in Hebrew means weeks. So this is the Feast of Weeks, and we're actually supposed to count, and that's That's part of the Feast of Weeks is that we're counting and we are preparing. And that's what today's message is all about. What are we to be thinking about? What are some of the lessons that we can learn and prepare ourselves for Shavuot, which in the original Shavuot, it was the master, uh, Yah, giving us the Torah. He was providing the, the teachings to Moshe to give to the, to the people. And yet, in Acts chapter 2, we see later in what would become the, the apostolic period, it's not about the master, Yah, providing the teachings. It's about Yeshua providing to us the teacher. Amen. That's why we're preparing for the outpouring. Everybody say, I'm preparing for the outpouring. So the period of time between the Reed Sea, or you also know it as the Red Sea, the Red Sea crossing, and Yah meeting with Israel on Mount Sinai would encompass that 50-day period between first fruits and Shavuot. So let's look at some of the events that transpired. We can actually go into the Torah and we can, we can read about the teachings those events that will teach us as we prepare for the outpouring on Shavuot. Amen? So the first lesson that we see is found in Exodus chapter 15, starting with verse 22. And this is the bitter waters made sweet. So if you're wondering what what should we be thinking about? What should we be praying about? What should we be meditating on? What should we be learning in this period between first fruits and Shavuot? This is the first lesson that we can read in the Torah that would prepare our hearts and our minds to have a powerful Shavuot or Pentecost. Amen? Exodus chapter 15, starting with verse 22. I'm going to read the whole story, and then we're just going to glean Uh, from what we see here, all right? It says, And Moshe brought Israel from the Sea of Reeds, also known as the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Everybody say they went out into the wilderness. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. 
and they came to Marah, and they were unable to drink the waters of Mara, so they found water, but they couldn't drink it. For they, the waters, were bitter. And the name of it was called Mara. In Hebrew, that means bitter. And the people grumbled against Moshe. Everybody say grumbled. grumbled. They grumbled against Moshe, saying, What are we to drink? Then he cried out to Yah, and Yah showed him a tree. And when he threw it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. All right, so that's, that's kind of a biblical water purification system. Amen. He threw a tree into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made a law and a right ruling for them. And there he tried them, or he tested them. And he said, if... You diligently obey the voice of Yah, your Elohim, and do what is right in his eyes, and shall listen to his commands, and shall guard all his laws. In other words, be obedient to what he says. Notice, he says, I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites, or the Egyptians, for I am Yah who heals you. Amen. He's our healer, is he not? Praise Yah. He says, if you'll obey me, if you'll listen to my words, if you're diligent, if you do the things that I, that I ask you to do, then I'm not going to place on you the diseases that I put on the Egyptians, but instead I'm going to be your healer. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's talk about some of the things that we can glean from, from this episode that we read in the Torah. The first thing is there is a wilderness between Egypt and the promised land. I'll let that sink in for a second. There is a wilderness. Now, I know you could say amen concerning that, all right? There is a wilderness between your born-again experience and the time that we see Yeshua face-to-face. There is a wilderness. Everybody say, there is a wilderness. And just because we believe in Yeshua and are delivered out of the bondage of sin, that doesn't mean that we're going to walk through life on a flowery bed of ease, all right? Life is a fight. Do you believe that? And the scripture tells us that we're to fight the good fight of faith. There's a wilderness between your born-again experience or what some people would call the salvation experience and when we see Yeshua, all right? Yah uses the wilderness of this life to humble us. Everybody say humble us. And to try us. He wants to find out what's in our hearts and to teach us about himself, all right? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. It says, guard to do every command which I command you today, that you might live. Everybody say live. Live. And shall increase. Say increase. Increase. And go in. Say go in. in. And shall possess. Say possess. Possess. The land of which Yah swore to your fathers. All right. Well, notice it says if we'll obey, if we'll guard to keep the commandments, we'll live, we'll increase. We'll go into a good place. We'll possess the land which Yah has swore to our fathers. All right. This applies to a spiritual place of blessing as well. Can you say amen? Amen. And you shall remember that Yah, your Elohim, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. All right. Now, Yeshua has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that right? We have the Ruach, the Holy Spirit living within us. The fire by uh, night and the cloud by day is living in us, leading us every step through this wilderness that we're in. Can you say amen? Amen. It says, verse 2, And you shall remember that Yah, your Elohim, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. There it is. He wants us to walk humbly before Him. Amen. To prove you, to test you, to find out what really is in your heart. To know what's in your heart, whether you guard his commands or not. All right? That's what the wilderness is all about, folks. And he humbled you. All right? Well, how many of you have ever been humbled? How many of you know life can humble you? Amen? Whether it be a financial situation, a financial wilderness, or a a family relational wilderness, or, or some other type of wilderness. The wilderness can and will humble us. It'll, it'll drive us to our knees uh, as it relates to prayer and seeking the Almighty. Amen? And that's, that's what He wants. 
He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to call on Him. He wants us to see Him as provider. Amen? And as rewarder. Can you say a good amen? amen. Verse 3, And He humbled you and let you suffer hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, to make you know. All right, so he wants to teach us something. See, some of the stuff you're going through right now is within Yah's plan to teach you something. Now, I know we get the idea, you know, you've heard people say, well, you know, if you just accept Jesus, if you just accept Yeshua, then everything's going to get better. It's all just going to be a bed of roses. Amen. You've heard that? It's not true. Amen. He never promises us that we won't go through trials, tribulations, and challenges. As a matter of fact, the scripture says the exact opposite of that. What he promises is that we will be victorious in those situations when we walk with him. Can you say amen? amen. To make you know that man does not live by bread alone. It says he lets you get hungry so that you could know that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yah, all right? The lesson is that we're to live by His word. We're to obey His word. Verse 4, your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Thus you shall know in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so Yah, your Elohim, disciplines you or makes a disciple out of you. You ever thought of it that way? He uses circumstances and situations in life to humble us so that we'll seek him because he wants us to become his disciple. Amen. Discipline means that we walk in his ways. All right. So, Yah, this is verse five, your Elohim disciplines you. Therefore, you shall guard the commands of Yah, your Elohim, to walk in his ways and fear him. Proverbs 9 and 10 says the fear of Yah is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the set apart one is understanding. Verse 7, for Yah, your Elohim, is bringing you into a good land. All right, a land of blessing and eternal joy in his presence. Do you believe that? A land of streams of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you eat bread without scarcity, in which you do not lack at all. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you dig copper. And you shall eat and be satisfied and shall bless Yah, your Elohim, for the good land which he has given you. Amen. Now, we know that the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, is going to be good. Amen. And we know that being in Yeshua's presence, Yah's presence, throughout the endless ages of eternity is going to be good. We, we also believe that if we will be obedient and walk in his ways, we will see the goodness of Yah in the land of the living. Can you say amen? And he wants you to have that kind of hope. He doesn't want you to walk around in despair, you know, and look like you're, you know, sucking on a lemon all the time, you know, and always negative. Amen. He wants you, he wants you to have that kind of hope and that kind of expectation that, that when you walk with him, you will see the goodness of Yah in the land of the living. Amen. Now, the next point I want to bring out of this passage is they went three days into the wilderness and couldn't find any water. All right. Now, this was a major test from Yah to see what they were made of. If you know, survival experts have this thing called the rule of threes. And they say you can live three minutes without air. In a harsh environment, you have about three hours to survive without shelter. After three days, you're in crisis without water. Your body begins to shut down. And, of course, you can make it about three weeks or so uh, without food. All right? So... They had used up all their stores of water that they brought uh, out of Egypt and from the last place where they were able to store it up. They went three days into the wilderness beyond the sea crossing, and they didn't have any water. So they were in complete crisis mode, okay? And Yah wanted to know how the people would respond in crisis. 
And, and really, he looks at us, and he also wants to know how we're going to respond in crisis. See, he had, he had delivered them out of slavery with mighty signs and wonders. He brought them through uh, the sea on, on dry ground, and he wanted to know if they would trust him to be their source, their source of provision. Had they learned that their Elohim was a miracle provider? Have you learned it yet? Have, have I learned that lesson as of yet? All right. Did they truly believe in the great I am who's an ever-present help in time of need? See, this was a test. Everybody say a test. You know those really an annoying alarms that go off on your television or on your radio? You know, ah, ah, ah. You know, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. You know, the broadcasters in your area and so on and so forth, right? It's very annoying. But this was a test. Y'all wanted to see if they really believed that he was their L who would provide and meet their needs. Amen. So what were they searching for three days in, in the wilderness without water? Well, obviously they were searching for water. Their focus was on water. We have to find water. We're looking for water. Some of you have a need and you get fixated on the need. I, I got to get money to meet this bill. I, I've got to, I've got to, you know, get something uh, that, that I need for my children, whatever it might be. You get fixated on the need when in reality, the Almighty wants us to focus on the need meter. Amen. Amen. Instead of being focused on the need, we need to get our focus on the need meter. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, And my Elohim shall fill all your need according to his riches in esteem by Messiah Yeshua. Well, hey, I tell you what, he's going to supply all your need according to his riches and esteem or glory by Messiah Yeshua. How rich do you think he is in glory? He is vastly rich in glory. Amen. And he's going to supply your need according to that. Praise Yah. Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? That sounds like wilderness wandering to me. Amen. That's what they were thinking. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Isn't that right? For all these the nations seek for and your heavenly father knows that you need all these. But seek first the reign of Elohim and his right way of doing things, his righteousness and all these, you could say all these things, all these needs, shall be added to you. That's one of the messages that we learn from this story about the bitter waters of Mara, is that we should not get fixated on the need. We keep our focus on the need meter. Amen? Because he knows what we need, and if we seek him first, all of the things that we need will be added. Can you say amen? Jeremiah 29, 11, a very uh, famous and, and uh, passage that so many people know and love. It says this, for I know the plans I am planning for you, declares Yah. Plans of peace, everybody say peace, peace. and not evil, say not evil. not evil, to give you a future, say a future. future, and an expectancy or a hope, all right? Then you shall call on me. And shall come and pray to me, and I shall listen, and you shall seek me, and shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, that's a promise, folks. He said, you will seek me, and you will find me. If, here's the if, if you search for me with all your heart. See, sometimes people say, well, you know, I just can't seem to, to find the Almighty. He, he just seems so hidden. He wants you to search Him out. If your focus is more on this world, you're not going to see Him. If your focus is more on the need, you're not going to see Him. But if you search Him out, if you seek for Him with your whole heart, He promises you that you will find Him. That's a promise. Hallelujah. And then in John chapter 7, verse 37, this is a, a wonderful passage about Yeshua. It says, on the last day, the great day of the festival, Yeshua stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Notice it didn't say, if anyone thirsts, let him go search out water. 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and let him who believes in me drink. As the scripture said, out of his innermost shall flow rivers of living water. Well, this is a reference to the Messiah. Out of his innermost will flow rivers of living water. If you're thirsty, you come to him to drink. And out of him will flow rivers of living water. Now, when you get filled with the Spirit, you have Yeshua living in you. Then out of you also flows rivers of living water. Amen. And he said this concerning the Spirit, which those believing in him were about to receive. All right. The the third thing I want to bring out of this story is that Yah allowed them to find what they were looking for. They were looking for water, but it was bitter. So their focus was on the need. They were so engrossed in this idea, we've got to have water. Of course, you know, the flesh was talking to them. You know, they were in a crisis mode. And so Yah said, okay, you want water? Then you can find the water. I'll let you find the water. You want to find the water? Find it. The problem was, it was bitter. It was bitter. See, a lot of times in life, Yah will let you find that thing that you thought would make you happy. Or fulfill your need. Only to discover that it wasn't what you thought it was. He'll let you find that relationship or that career or that notoriety or that pleasure. Only to discover that the best of life is bitter if you don't have Yah. If you don't have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with Yeshua, the best the world has to offer is bitter. If you're looking for the world to fulfill you, he may allow you to find that thing you're looking for only so that you can discover it's bitter, that it doesn't satisfy, that it doesn't fulfill you. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Yeshua said, for what is a man profited if he gains all the world and loses his own life? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? For the son of Adam, this is Yeshua, is going to come in the esteem and the glory of his father with his messengers. And then he shall reward each according to his works. So if if you gained everything in life and everything you thought you needed, everything you thought you wanted, but, but you didn't gain Yeshua, it's bitter and unfulfilling. And they were... They were unable to drink the water because it was bitter. See, material possessions are never able to satisfy and fulfill the longing of the human soul. How many of you have have known rich people who, when you look at them, you think they have everything. The big, beautiful house, the fine car, uh, the beautiful clothes. They have so much money. They have more money than they know what to do with. But they're miserable there, there are rich folks in this world, when you look at them, you would think, well, you ought to be satisfied. You ought to be happy. But they're not. They're miserable because money can't buy peace. Amen. Money can't buy acceptance from the Almighty. Money can't wash away your transgressions. Can you say amen? amen. Drugs and alcohol and sex and fame and fortune, these are the things that the flesh longs for. But none of them can satisfy Your real need. They're sweet to the mouth, but they're bitter to the stomach. Hallelujah. Psalm 107 verse 8 says, Let them give thanks to Yah for his loving commitment and his wonders to the children of men. For he has satisfied a longing being. He satisfied the longing soul, another, another translation says, and has filled the hungry being with goodness. So so who is only, who is the one who is only able to satisfy? If you think it's a, you found that girlfriend that you always wanted, or that boyfriend, or or that husband, or, or that job, you know, that dream job, you'll find out very quickly that those things are bitter without Yah, without Yeshua. He's the only one who can satisfy the longing soul. Do you believe that? The fourth thing that I want to draw out of this story is that In this situation, in this crisis situation, the people grumbled. All right? Well, that's human nature, is it not? But I tell you, we're not to to walk in our flesh. They grumbled, but Moses prayed. Now, that's the difference. 
All right. First Peter chapter three, verse 10 says this. For he who wishes to love life. How many of you want to love life? In other words, you, you want to have an enjoyable life. All right. Well, the scripture tells us how we, can, how we can have an enjoyable life. For he who wishes to love life and see good days. Do you want to see good days? All right. Notice what it tells us. Let him keep his tongue from evil. In other words, stop grumbling. Stop complaining. Stop murmuring. Stop speaking evil. Now, isn't it interesting that the scripture ties in your mouth and what you say with loving life, having an enjoyable life and and seeing good days? So the opposite has to be true. If if you want to have a life that's that's not enjoyable and and if you don't want to see good days, then, then just keep up the grumbling. Just say amen. If you say amen, everybody will think I'm talking about somebody else. Just keep on complaining, keep on murmuring, keep on having something evil to say about everybody. Amen. You know, when Yeshua taught, a lot of times people think he was teaching us not to make any kind of righteous judgment when he said, you know, don't judge lest you be judged. He's actually talking about don't be judgmental. Don't be hypercritical. Don't be fault finding. And he knew these passages. Isn't that right? But if you, if you want to have an enjoyable life and see good days, then keep your tongue from evil. And then it goes on to say, and your lips from speaking deceit. Verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it because the eyes of Yah are on the righteous. Those who are doing things his right way. Now, notice in this passage, it doesn't, it doesn't equate righteousness with some mental ascension of something. It's actually talking about living rightly. Come on, say amen. It's so whether you say amen or not. All right, because the eyes of Yah are where? On the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. All right, does it say his ears are open, open to their grumblings? How about their complaints? How about their murmurings? Is he listening to you when you engage in grumbling and complaining and murmuring? No, you're you're affecting your own well-being. You're tearing down your own life with those words. Can you say amen? I want to emphasize again, verse 12, because the eyes of Yah, how many of you want him to, to, to have his eyes on you? Because the eyes of Yah are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of Yah is against those who do evil. Again, grumbling and complaining and murmuring is part of that, doing evil. The face of Yah is against people who grumble and complain and murmur and speak evil. Amen. And then notice they grumbled against Moshe, against Moses. In other words, they were looking to man as their source. Now they grumbled against Moses. They should have looked to Yah. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. See, my question is, where's your trust? But we remember the name of Yah, our Elohim. All right, is Yah your trust? Do you trust in Him? See, there's a difference between grumbling against leadership And praying to the Almighty. If your tendency is to grumble against leadership and not pray to the Almighty, then you're tearing down your own life with your words that come out of your mouth. Can you say amen? And that's what they were doing. They were setting themselves up for destruction because they were grumbling against Moses instead of crying out to Yah. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, Yah says, Call unto me. And I shall answer you and show you great and inaccessible or unattainable matters which you have not known. Call unto me and I will answer you. That's another promise, is it not? Your Bible may say, and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. How many of you can think of some great things? I can think of some great things. How many of you can think of some pretty mighty things? You know what I'm saying? I mean, just some really powerful things. Yah says if you call unto him, if you become a person of prayer, 
If you call unto him, he will answer you and show you great and mighty matters that you don't even know. That you haven't even thought of yet. Amen. So, so his plan for you is better than you even know. If you'll do the right things. Can you say amen? amen. Moses knew the answer was prayer and not grumbling. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, do not worry at all. How much worry are we supposed to engage in? Do not worry at all. But in every matter, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to Elohim, and the peace of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Messiah Yeshua. So we're not to worry at all. See, see, worry is making a down payment on something that may not come to pass. You're already paying toward something bad that may not even come to pass. Is that not a total waste of time and effort? To worry means you're investing. You are investing into something negative that may not come to pass. And when you worry, it's the opposite of belief. Actually, it is worry is belief. It's belief in the wrong direction. Amen. Amen. And so we're not to worry at all. We're not to believe in the wrong direction ever. But what are we to do? Pray and petition and give thanks and let our requests be made known to Elohim. And I love this next passage. It says, and the peace of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding. Have you ever had peace in the midst of a crisis? And when you look at what's going on around you, you don't even know and can't describe how you have peace in the midst of that storm. The storm is raging so horribly around you, yet you have peace. And, and you can't even fathom that peace. You can't describe it. It's beyond your understanding. That's the kind of peace the Almighty wants to give to us when we pray. The kind of peace that surpasses your understanding. And it's that kind of peace that, that puts the devil in a phone booth dialing 911. Amen. We should never act the way the devil's trying to make us feel. Let me say that again. We should never act the way the devil's trying to make us feel. Not worry, but instead pray, bring our petitions, give thanks. Thank him in advance. Amen. And then his peace. Yeshua said, my peace I give you. It's not some, it's not some worked up peace. Well, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to calm myself. I'm going to have a nice uh, uh, cup of hot chamomile tea. And, and I'm just going to try to relax. You know, I'm just going to, I want to try to get into this peace, you know, peace zone. You're not going to be able to work up some kind of peace. Amen. It's his peace that he gives to you. His peace. Shalom that he gives to you. And, it, and, and it, it passes your, it surpasses your understanding. In other words, you can't figure it out with your mind. Don't you love things that come from the Almighty that you can't figure out with your mind? In other words, we say it in modern vernacular, he will blow our minds with his goodness. Amen. And the peace of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts like a like a soldier mounts guard and garrisons your heart and your mind through Messiah Yeshua. He'll place a guard on your heart and your mind. Amen? All right. Number five. Yah showed Moses a tree. You say, what's up with that? Well, he'd seen a lot of trees before Moses, you know? This was a special tree. So Yah gave Moses a revelation of Messiah's redemptive work that he would accomplish when he died on the tree. Amen. In other words, he preached Messiah to Moses beforehand. You say, is there any biblical precedence for Yah preaching Messiah to these who went before even Messiah was born? Absolutely. I'll start with Abraham. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. It says, And the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right 
the nations by belief, announced the good news. Everybody say the good news. To whom? Abraham. When? Beforehand. Saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. That's Genesis 12, 3 and Genesis 18, 18, verse 9. So that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham the believer. So Yah preached the good news of Messiah to Abraham. He got a revelation in advance. Well, the same thing happened with Moshe. All right. The good news was preached beforehand to Moses. And uh, the scripture says that Yah showed him a, a tree or he showed him the execution of Messiah long before it actually happened. And more than just the execution, but the benefits that would come through that redemptive work. John chapter 5, verse 45, Yeshua said, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moshe or Moses, in whom you have set your expectation or your hope. For if you believed Moshe, you would have believed me. Since he wrote about me. Well, you can't write about someone unless you've received a revelation about them. Isn't that right? Verse 47. But if you do not believe his writings when he wrote about me, how shall you believe my words? All right. And then Isaiah 53. I I have to stop a moment and just share with you what Isaiah saw. Isaiah 53 verse 4. Truly. He has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains, yet we reckoned him smitten, stricken by Elohim and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our crookednesses. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. So Yeshua came to take our bitter water. He came to take the bitter water of sin and death and make it sweet through his redemptive work. All right. Number six, when the bitter waters of life come into contact with the tree of Messiah, the waters become sweet. All right. We're talking about living water. Now, you, you, you know this wonderful story about the woman at the well in Samaria. Let's go over there and take a look at it real quick. John chapter four. Starting with verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Yeshua said to her, give me to drink. The woman of Samaria therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Yehudi or a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Yehudim or Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Yeshua answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of Elohim, And who it is who says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. All right. In other words, turn your bitterness, your bitter waters of sin and transgression, the bitterness of life into sweet living water. Amen. Verse 11, the woman said to him, master, you have no vessel and the well is deep. From where then do you have living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Verse 13, Yeshua answered and said to her, everyone drinking of this water shall thirst again. Verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water I give him shall certainly never thirst. For the water that I give him shall become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Hallelujah. That's, that's, that's speaking of the born again experience. Amen. To have a fountain of living water springing up on the inside of you to everlasting life. The woman said to him, Master, give me this water so that I do not thirst nor come here to draw. Yeshua said to her, go, call your husband and come here. Now, he's going to point out the bitterness of the waters of her life with this. All right. Go call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Yeshua said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Master, I see that you're a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. So she, she notices that he has read her mail, basically, and notices he's a prophet. So now she's going to ask him a question that's been really on her mind for a long time. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you people say in Jerusalem is the place where one needs to worship. Yeshua said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because the deliverance is of the Yehudim, the Jews. But the hour is coming. Everybody say the hour is coming. And now is. Say and now is. When the true worshipers, put your hand up if you're a true worshiper, shall worship the Father in what? Spirit and truth. For the Father also does seek such to worship Him. Elohim is spirit and those who worship Him need to worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called anointed. When the one comes, he shall announce to us all. Verse 26, Yeshua said to her, I who am speaking to you am he. In other words, I am. I am. I am the one who can take your bitter life, the bitterness of your sin, the bitterness of your depravity, the bitterness of your, your wrecked life situations, and I can turn the bitter waters sweet. Now, I'd have to say, we could probably all testify to that. But I was in the rock and roll bands, front man, hair down in the middle of my back, dyed jet black, earring in my ear, playing the rebel by the handbook, trying to make it happen for myself, living a life of bitter, bitter, bitter waters. And he was able to come into those nightclubs, not because he was there wanting to do what I was doing there, but because I was there. And he saved me from the guttermost to the uttermost. And he turned the bitterness of my life and the bitter waters of my sin into sweet waters. And he flooded my spirit with living water. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. I've been nearly 30 years in the ministry. Amen. Praise Yah, and every one of you have a testimony of how he turned your bitter waters into sweet. Well, she believed in him and was forgiven and began to tell others how Yeshua turned her bitter waters into sweet, and a whole city came to know Yeshua as Messiah. The last thing I want to point out is that healing and health are associated with obedience. So we've been talking about things that we're to meditate on, things that we're to to learn and to, to think about and to pray about as we, as we count the Omer. And as we get closer, I'm going to bring a, a, another account each week that we can learn from as we prepare for the outpouring. Amen? So let's talk about healing and health associated with obedience. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And he, Yah, said... If you diligently obey the voice of Yah, your Elohim, and do what is right in his eyes, and shall listen to his commands, and shall guard all his laws, I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites, for I am Yah who heals you. Now, let me, let me warn you of something. If you're ever embracing a doctrine where you have to make excuses for the whole Bible being in agreement. In other words, well, all that passed away, so we kind of look at that differently now. All right? Run from that. All right? All of the Bible agrees. It's one continuous agreeing revelation. And if you're sitting under something where somebody has to say, oh, well, you know, uh, we're going to try to glean a little something from that passage, but, but you know, nowadays... Um, uh, God uh, doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't judge people with those kinds of things, you know. And, and then I would say if, the, if, if that person or that teacher can't make the whole Bible agree, don't sit under that teaching anymore. Yeah. Amen. Now, now we don't have to make excuses for it anymore, do we? Yeah. Amen. Let's just read it for what it says. All right. All right. Instead of trying to make some excuse about how he does it differently now. All right. If you diligently obey the voice of Yah. Your Elohim. Does he mean what he say? All right. And do what's right in his eyes. Are we to do what's right in his eyes? And listen to his commands and shall guard all his laws, his instructions. Notice what he says. 
that he will do if we do those things. I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites. In other words, those judgments. See, if you do the opposite of these things, there are judgments. That's why he said, I set before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. You can choose. You can choose. You can choose to have life. You can choose to have death. You can choose to walk in the blessing. You can choose to walk in the curses. Amen. It's your choice. And so there were those, the Mitzrites, who chose to not listen to Yah and not obey Him and not do what He said. They chose death and they chose curses. It wasn't Yah who just said, I like you, but I don't like you. I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to curse you. He says, I put the choice before you. You choose. Amen. Amen. Notice what he says. If we do these things that please him, if we obey him and follow his instructions, he says, I shall bring on you none of the diseases. Or you can say curses. I brought on the Mitzrites. For I am Yah who heals you. So what is, what is his plan for you? What does he want for you? He wants you to be well. He wants you to be healed. He he wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have living water in you, flowing through you. Amen? He wants your children to be blessed. He wants your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to walk in the blessings. But you choose. And, And there are generational blessings and there are generational curses. And your choice will decide. So he declares himself our healer. So so as we prepare for the outpouring, this is something we need to meditate on. That he's our healer. That he wants to heal us. He wants us to walk in divine health. And then look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. It says, and it shall be if you do not obey the voice of Yah, your Elohim, to guard, to do all his commands and his laws, which I command you today, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Look at verse 21. Yah makes the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. Yah strikes you with the wasting disease and with inflammation and with burning and with extreme heat and with the sword and with blight, and with mildew, and they shall pursue you until you perish. All right. Nobody likes to read those. But it's there. Amen. And notice that disease is associated with disobedience. Is it not? A lot of times we just want to think, well, you know, uh, it's more to do with uh, the the flu virus that came to town or being around a bunch of kids or this, that, or the other thing. Well, it has a lot, of, a lot to do with the fact that, that, that we don't take good care of our temples, too. Amen. You pour toxins into your body, you're going to get sick. Can you say amen? If, you're, if your eating habits are so horrible... Now, fortunately, since we've been following Yah, we're not putting all those animals that are loaded with toxins in our bodies anymore. Say amen, and everybody will believe that what I'm saying is goes for you too. Amen. But it is what it is. Disobedience does open the door for sickness and disease. That's why it says in, in the book of James, well, let's go ahead and read it. James chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him having anointed him with oil in the name of the master and the prayer of belief shall save the sick and the master shall raise him up. Notice that he asked a question that some of us would think is a silly question. But I'm going to show you how how it wasn't a silly question in those days. So so James, you know, if if we if we had a, a, a prayer time in most congregations and I've pastored very large congregations, and we were praying for sick people, you'd see hundreds of sick people in the body come down for prayer. So that's why this kind of sounds like a silly, silly question to ask. Is there, is there anybody, anybody out there? Is there anybody that's sick? James is like searching for somebody that's sick. Right? Is anyone among you sick? It ought to be that scarce Amen. in the body of Messiah. 
that we have to ask, is there anybody out there that's, that's sick? We have the elders ready. They've got the anointing oil. They're ready to anoint you with oil. And the prayer of belief will save the sick. And the master will raise you up. If there's anybody out there that's sick, come on down. We're going we're to minister to you today. Again, if you give that opportunity in most churches, there's scores of people that flood down the aisle. Because they don't understand these principles. And the prayer of belief shall save the sick and the master shall ra raise him up. And if he has committed sins, isn't it interesting that he ties in sin, disobedience with sickness and disease. And if he has committed sins, he shall be forgiven. Notice what it says. Tell everybody how great you are and how righteous you are. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another so that you are healed. What does that say? That actually has a very strong implication. And that implication is that sin has a lot to do with our sickness. And that if we will hit it head on. Now, I'm not judging anybody for being sick. You know, I've had occasion myself. Right? But the fact is, if we hit it head on and, and we look and we ask the question, how have I disobeyed? Is there something I need to confess? Isn't that right? It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another so that you are healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous one accomplishes much. Amen. And then I want to end with this, Proverbs 4, starting with verse 20. My son, my daughter, listen to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. My teachings, my tarot, my instructions. Let them not depart from your eyes. All right, so read them. Read them every day. Guard them in the midst of your heart. Put his word in your heart. Why is it important for you to read the Bible every day? Do you want to stay well? Do you want to stay free from sickness and disease? How about those of us that are over 50? Do we want to live the last 10 years in a, in a facility somewhere? Absolutely not. Amen. We want to stay well. How are we going to do it? The Almighty gives us the plan right here. Read the word every day. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Guard them in the midst of your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them. Notice you have to find them. They don't find you. You got to find them. Some people are like, well, I'm young and I'm going to live forever. Oh, the day will come. Yeah, it will. And everybody that knows what I'm talking about says amen. amen. For they are life to those who find them. And what? Health or healing to all their flesh. So if, if you want to know how to stay healthy, if you want to know how to walk in divine health, have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with Yeshua through the word, through the word. Read it every day. Get it into your heart. Amen. Find his word because it's life to those that find them and health or healing to all their flesh. So as we, as we take this journey from the crossing of the sea to Mount Sinai, as we take this journey from first fruits to Shavuot, let's keep these things in mind. Let's meditate on these things. Let's glorify Yah that he's all these things to us. Amen. And let's prepare for a powerful outpouring of the spirit on Shavuot. Amen. Hallelujah.